Here we go. Got a new Bible study place. New Bible study location. Out there in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> hey, everybody. Gonna do a little Bible study. Been a couple days. Been a couple days. Somebody's here. I don't know. Oh, wait. hey, Mom. You made it. My mom made it. Yay. Awesome. I hope you had a nice day. I know, Mom, that you worked too hard already. I know that. So I'm sorry that you're working so much. I'm sorry that you're working so hard. I love you. I see my brother Tony's here. I know if Tony's here, I know Ian, Ian and Sherry are here. So welcome, my family. I can't wait to see your wedding go down. What do we got? Another eight days, nine days, ten days, something like that. I got my wife here. I got my mom here. I got my brother here. Bunch of locals. We'll just give it a minute, see if anybody else comes along. Just give it a minute, see what happens. You guys get the preview of the, the, the house, the new house back there. What do you think about it? You like it? <laughs> you got the new house. You got the sneak peek of the new house. Mm -hmm. So we'll just wait another second, then we'll get started on the Bible study. Let's see, what, what did we talk about last time? Oh, we talked about, was it America was the beast of the earth? Yeah, we talked about America being the beast of the earth and that America is the one who is actually going to be the one to enforce the mark of the beast. That was a, that was a sad Bible study. That was a very sad Bible study. Oh, you like my wall? Thank you, Mom. That's that's my favorite wall. <laughs> that's my favorite wall. The other the walls over here, that's my less favorite walls. Well, I guess we probably should get started on the Bible study. So, you know, pretty lady, why don't you come say a prayer with us? Got the Balloon Brothers gear on. Balloon Brothers. Here we go. Let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to stop and thank you for an opportunity to do Bible study. We want to ask in a special way that your Holy Spirit would be with us in a double portion to guide us, to teach us, to show us uh, what the scriptures have to say about the seven last plagues, and also to protect us. So Heavenly Father, as we move forward, help us to take serious the message of the hour, and help us to get prepared for your second coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so here we go. Hey, Aunt Chrissy. Nice to see you, Aunt Chrissy. Nice to see you indeed. So as we get ready to do the Bible study, I just want to say this. Uh, the Bible studies have been like a progression. We've been going through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We're into like the more advanced Bible studies. If you want to do Bible studies with us and you're looking to start from the beginning, we're more than happy to do Bible studies with you. Um, from the beginning, the ABCs, one, two, threes, either at your house or whatever. If you aren't comfortable with us coming, we can have somebody come who you don't know. So if you are interested in Bible studies to help prepare you for the second coming, let us know. We will get at you and um, it doesn't have to be us. It could be somebody else. But we are taking this serious. So we're going to get started, and we're going to be talking about typology. We're going to be talking about the plagues today, the seven last plagues that fall on the wicked. And we're going to be using typology to get a better understanding of how the plagues, how the circumstances around the plagues take place, and what actually happens when the plagues fall. So let's get started with the scripture quotes, and we're going to go to Psalm 89.34. And these scriptures are there for us to have a basis of understanding what typology is. Typology is a small example of a greater truth. It's kind of like a shadow. So Psalm 89.34 says this. Psalm 89.34 says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So if God says something, that means he will not change it. 
If God says something, he will not change it. In fact, if God says something, he cannot change it. So the first point of typology that we want to make is if God says something, he will not change it. And so what we're going to do now is go to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. This is the second principle of typology. And typology, again, is a small example of a greater truth. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. And this is a very eye-opening Bible study. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says this. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So here in Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, God is telling us that he declares the end from the beginning. And we want to remember that, because that is one of the main principles of typology. Typology is a small example of a greater truth. And uh, essentially, typology is declaring what the end is like from the beginning. So Psalm 89, 34, God says, what comes out of my mouth, I will not change it. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, I declare the end from the beginning. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. We're building up the understanding of what typology is. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Amos chapter 3, verse 7 says this, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Now, if God is going to do something, he's going to make sure he reveals that to his servants, the prophets. Who are his servants, the prophets, in these modern times? The modern day prophets are the Bible. And so if God is going to do something, like the seven plagues, he's going to give us understanding about that through the scriptures. So surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophet. So if there's going to be a mark of the beast, if there's going to be an image of the beast, if there's going to be seven last plagues, surely the Lord God will not do any of those things unless he reveals the secrets of those things through his word. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. This is what it says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. Who is them? Well, them is the nation of Israel. What happened to the nation of Israel happened as examples. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now all these things that happened unto them, the nation of Israel, for examples, that they are written for our admonition upon the ends of the world are come. So what happened in the past, what happened to ancient Israel, and what happened in the historic part of the Bible, those are examples for us to learn from. And put these four texts together, that what God says, he doesn't change that God declares the end from the beginning, that whatever God is doing, he reveals his secrets through the prophets, which are the scriptures today, and that what happened in the past is an example for us who live at the end time. This is typology. Typology is a small example of a greater truth. A example is that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, that's the greater truth. The smaller example was always the lamb in the sanctuary system. If you wanted your sins, you had to have a lamb to have your sins forgiven. Jesus is the greater example of that. Now we're going to start looking at the future events of what the Bible talks about, the things that haven't happened yet, right? The mark of the beast, the image of the beast, the plagues. Anytime the Bible is referring to future events, it's called eschatology. We're not going to use that term in our Bible study, but that's what the term uh, eschatology, it means future events. And uh, so according to the Bible, there are some things that haven't happened yet. An example of something that hasn't happened yet is the mark of the beast. That hasn't been um, legislated yet. So typology, specifically typology, helps us understand the future events of the Bible. This is very, very, very important. 
that the typology, the small examples, point to greater truths in the future. And so for us to understand the mark of the beast, the image of the beast and the plagues, we need to look at the small examples that the Bible gave us. So God foretold some very intense events that would take place in the future and that his people would get caught up in these events. And God is warning his people in the end times, this is what's going to happen. Don't get caught up in that. And so for us, as God's end time people, he gave us some examples in the past to learn from. So that as we see the situations that took place in the past, so too we can watch history and say, you know, I see the same scenario taking place now. Is this a warning sign for me to get ready? So let's look at that. Let's look at some warning signs. But for a second, let's shift over to this idea. And let's talk about something in the Bible called prophecy. Prophecy has two separate meanings. It can mean preaching, right? When I'm preaching the word of God, that means I'm prophesying. But prophecy also means a foretelling of an event, right? If God gives a prophecy that says, this future event is going to take place. And that's the kind of prophecy we're talking about right now. And there's two kinds of prophecy. This is very important to understand. There's two kinds of prophecies. There's time-based prophecy. And a time-based prophecy is something that when a specific time is given, right? There are some examples in the Bible of time-based prophecies. Time-based prophecies are something like the 70-week prophecy, which is found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. That's a time-based prophecy. That's a 70-week prophecy. There's another example of a time-based prophecy, the 2,300-day prophecy. That's found in Daniel 8, 13, and 14. We talked about these already. These are time-based prophecies. Prophecies around the Antichrist ruling was 42 months, 1,260 days, three and a half years. These are time-based prophecies. But then there are other prophecies that are events-based prophecies. There's a difference between the two. The time-based prophecy, God will give you a time frame and he'll say, from this time to this time, this specific thing is going to happen. An event-based prophecy is different in the fact that it's certain circumstances around an event cause the prophecy to be fulfilled. This is very important for specific issues like the mark of the beast, like the image of the beast, like the plagues. The mark of the beast, the image of the beast, the plagues, these are not time-based prophecies. These are event-based prophecies. And so what we want to do is we're going to begin to look at the plagues, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, because we want to understand them so we don't get caught up in them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the events that surround the prophecies that are event-based specifically image of the beast, mark of the beast, and the plagues. But we have to use typology to do that, right? At the end of the time, in the end time, it says that there will be a mark of the beast. And God told us in Isaiah 46, 9 to 10, that he tells us the end from the beginning. So if the end time there was a mark, in the beginning was there a mark? Yes, there was. The mark of Cain. So in the end, there'll be a mark. In the beginning, there was a mark. What can I learn from the beginning to tell me about the end? Very important, very important. And we're going to use typology that is going to help us to understand this. So how do I explain the mark of the beast? How do I explain the image of the beast? How do I explain the plagues? Well, I have to use typology. So we're going to go back into the scriptures, and we're going to look for situations that had similar circumstances with plagues. And we're going to see what are the situations that took place to cause the event of plagues to fall. And we'll use these small examples and apply them to the future and see, whoa, 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 whoa. These is actually telling me that we are on the verge of plagues today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get into um, the typology 
four plagues. And typology is a very biblical principle for studying the Bible. It's a small example of a greater truth, right? So Jesus used typology. If you go to the book of John chapter 9, or I'm sorry, uh, John 6, 49 to 51, we see Jesus is talking to the nation of Israel. And he's having a conversation about manna. And they're saying, oh, give us the manna, give us the manna. And Jesus is saying, listen, your fathers who ate the manna are dead. I'm telling you that I am the true bread from heaven. So manna was a small example, bread from heaven, was a small example of a greater truth. Jesus, the true bread from heaven. But Jesus gets even deeper in his typological explanation. Because in Matthew 17, 10 to 13, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. And the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, doesn't the scripture say that Elijah, Elijah, Elias must come before the Messiah? And he says, yes, that's true. The scriptures say that. And I tell you that Elias has come. And after Jesus gets done explaining, the disciples understand that Jesus talks about John the Baptist. This is found in Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 to 13. Jesus is using typology here. And he says that Elijah that was to come, that was John the Baptist. That's a typological situation, a small example of a greater truth. Now let's get into the plagues. And we're going to see some pretty crazy stuff here about these plagues. And these plagues are going to fall upon the wicked at the end time. And if you have the mark of the beast, if you don't have the inner fortitude to reject the mark of the beast, this is going to fall upon you. And we're studying this so that that does not take place. Okay, let's go and see the first example of plagues. Genesis 12, verses 14 to 20. Genesis 12, 14 to 20. Here we go. We're going to kind of go through it a little quick. Genesis 12, 14 to 20. And it came to pass when Abraham was went into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman. Who is the woman? Why does it say the woman? That she was very beautiful. The princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And when he entreated Abraham well for her sake, he had sheep and oxen and axes and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh's house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, what is it that thou hast done unto me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I may have taken her to be my wife. Now, therefore, behold, take thy wife, take her and go away. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away. Now, let's check this out. Earlier in the text, in verse 13, Abraham's talking to Sarah and this is what he says. I pray you, say that you're my sister, that it may be well for my sake that I will not be killed. So Abraham is entering into Egypt and he tells his wife, we're gonna lie, right? Was it a, was it a full lie? No, well, Abraham, Sarah was his wife, It was his, uh, but it was also his sister, his half sister. They had the same father, they had different mothers. And so Abraham here is lying and he goes into Egypt and he says, I'm scared that they're gonna kill us because you're so beautiful. I want to, when we go in here, we're going to say that you're my sister. And Abraham allows his wife to be taken by Pharaoh. And as a result, plagues fall. Let's break this down typologically. What does a woman stand for? A woman stands for a church. Okay. So what does Pharaoh stand for? Pharaoh was a political leader which was a religious head figure, right? Pharaoh was the incarnation of Horus, and so he stood as the figurehead of a religion. This is very, very, very important. So 
We have a woman. We have a wife, right? What does the wife stand for? The wife stands for the bride of Christ, the church. We have a wife. We have a church. We have a husband. We have Abraham was a shepherd. We have a shepherd. What is that a symbol of? Right? So Pharaoh, a religious political leader, takes the bride. He takes the church with the intention of having an inappropriate relationship with her, right? That would have been adultery. Spiritually, this would have been apostasy. So a religious political figure takes the woman, takes the church for an inappropriate relationship, and as a result, what happened? Plagues fell. Now, we want to look at it like this. Who was the one, who's the one that caused this trouble? It was Abraham that caused the trouble. Abraham was the one who lied. Why did not the plagues fall on Abraham, but they fell on Pharaoh? Well, Abraham repented of his sin. And as a result, the plagues did not go on Abraham, but the plagues fell on the unrepentant. Very important for us to understand that, right? There was a religious political leader who took the wife, he took the bride, he took the church, and his intentions was to have an inappropriate relationship. He wanted to have an, apost an apostate, a fornication relationship. And as a result, plagues fell. The plagues did not fall on the repentant. The plagues fell on the unrepentant. And when did the plagues come off? Finally, when Pharaoh had repented. This is a small example of a greater truth. Abraham was the one who lied. Now, when Pharaoh took Sarah, the wife, he put her in the harem. He had many women in this place that he would have an appropriate relation with. What does this harem stand for? Well, if a woman's a church, right? And there are many churches that this religious political leader has an inappropriate relationship. We could call that an ecumenical relationship, an ecumenical movement. That's just a little hint, a little clue for my people who are out there who are studying this on a deeper level. Abraham was afraid to be associated with the church because he was afraid it was going to cost him his life. The plagues fell on Pharaoh, not on Abraham, because Abraham was repentant. It broke his heart what he did. What he, His one lie caused his wife to be taken, and only by the grace of God that nothing inappropriate happened. But this is something to learn from. Typologically, we want to see that a religious political leader takes the church and tries to have an inappropriate relationship, which causes plagues to fall. This is very important for us to understand the plagues of the end times. Okay, our second example, our second example of plagues falling is found in 1 Samuel Chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. We're not going to read all of the, the chapters. It's going to take too long. But we're going to do an overview of each chapter. Okay, a little bit of background. The nation of Israel is in apostasy. They are not thinking right. And they go to war with the Philistines. The, the Philistines represent God's enemies. Very important to understand. The Philistines represent God's enemies. And... Israel, who's in an apostate state, begin to fight with the Philistines, God's enemies, and the Israelites lose. And so the Israelites think to themselves, we're going to take the ark, and we're going to use the ark to win the battle, because for some reason they thought the ark was God. The ark was not God. So they take the ark into battle, and what happens? They lose the two high priest son or the high priest sons die and the ark is taken and the Philistines take the ark. So the Israelites go to war with the Philistines. They lose the ark and um, 
the battle is lost. The Philistines take the ark. And if you go to, that was chapter 4. If you go to chapter 5, you'll see that the ark is subject to the Philistines' deity. And the Philistines' deity, who was Dagon, it could not stand up against the ark. Every, every night that went by, the, the, the statue of Dagon would fall on its face. The pagan deity could not stand against the ark. As a result of the Philistines subjecting the ark to a pagan deity, plagues fall. This is very, very important to understand. Let's break this down. The Philistines represent God's enemies. Let's remember that. The Philistines represent God's enemies, right? The Ark of God represents his throne. The Ark of the Covenant was God's throne on earth. This is what the Ark was. And the Ark represented God's authority and God's law. Israel was God's people, but the Philistines were God's enemies, and the ark represented God's throne, specifically his authority and his law. And this is what happens. The enemies of God, the Philistines, the enemies of God, tried to take the authority and law of God and subject it to a pagan deity. This is very important to understand that when the enemies of God try to usurp the authority and law of God, plagues fall. Very, very important that for us to understand that as a result of anybody trying to usurp, trying to take over the authority and law of God, plagues fall. Plagues fall. So when the enemies of God try to say that they're stronger and mightier and have more authority than God and his law, plagues fall. Very important. Very important for us to understand. This is the second example. When the enemies of God try to subject the authority and law of God, plagues fall. The, the third example is... Um, the Exodus, when Moses went to Pharaoh. Um, this is in Exodus chapter 5. We're going to read verses, uh, Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to see some greater information when it comes to the plagues. Oftentimes, Exodus is the prime example of typology and the end times. It's like so, filled so much with information that tells us about what the end times is going to be like. Specifically, the plagues in Egypt is an expansion of information of uh, how the plagues fall. So here we go. Uh, Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And afterward, Moses and Aaron were went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? to let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, where do ye, Moses, let the people from their burdens get ye unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are many. And ye make them rest from their burdens. And Pharaoh commanded the same day the taskmasters of the people, of their officials, saying, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as up to this point. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. Doesn't sound like much. There's so much information in this text. Let's break it down. We have Pharaoh, right? The first example we had was Pharaoh. What was he? Pharaoh was a political leader who was the representative of a religion. Specifically, he was the embodiment of Horus. So he was a religious figurehead. He was a political religious figurehead. Did he have 
the people of God in bondage. He did. Remember what the first Pharaoh did with Sarah, right? He was a political religious figurehead. Didn't he take the woman, didn't he take the church and put her in bondage? Did she want to, she didn't want to be there. That was against her will. Here we see more information. So here in Exodus chapter five, verses one through seven, we see a, 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 a Pharaoh, a political religious figurehead has the church, has God's people in bondage. And when it's time to come and worship God according to what God said, right? God had talked to Pharaoh at the burning bush and he said, I want you to deliver my people. I want them to come out into the wilderness and worship me a specific way. Very important to understand that. And what's Pharaoh's response? He says to Moses, and ye, Moses, make the people rest from their burden. The original word there is Shabbat. Moses was teaching the people to Shabbat. Moses was teaching the people to keep the Sabbath. And what happened? Pharaoh got upset that the people were keeping the Sabbath. And what did he do? The Pharaoh created anti-Sabbath legislation that forced the people to not keep the Sabbath, right? God said, I want the people to worship a certain way. And Pharaoh said, you will not do what God says. You will do what I say. And he created anti-Sabbath legislation. This is literally what happened. The word here is Shabbat. And he said, you will not keep the Shabbat. And then he sent legislation to his political enforcers saying that they will not keep the Shabbat. This is very important. What happens after Moses makes this anti-Sabbath legislation? Well, in chapter five, this situation takes place. Uh, got a political religious head prevents God's people from worshiping according to the way that God says, creates anti-Sabbath legislation, and what happens next? Plagues fall. The plagues fall after a religious political figurehead prevents God's people from worshiping the way God says they should, and then creates anti-Sabbath legislation, and as a result, plagues fall. This is crazy. Now let's look at this for a second because who's, who's Pharaoh talking to? Pharaoh's talking to Moses. What was Moses? Moses was a murderer. Did Moses deserve the plagues? Moses did deserve the plagues. How come Moses did not receive the plagues? Well, it's the same thing that happened with Abraham. Moses was a person who repented and turned from his sins. And as we look and into the future, the, the future event plagues, we're going to see that the, the plagues fall on people who refuse to give up their sin, right? Moses, he repented, but did Pharaoh repent? Pharaoh did not repent. Pharaoh acknowledged the fact that he sinned, but he did not repent. So we have a political religious figurehead who has God's people in bondage, right? That's a woman, that's a church. And he refuses to let God's people worship according to the way that God says they should. And he creates anti-Sabbath legislation. This is very important because these are the examples we are to learn from when we are going to look at the future typological, the last, the seven last plagues. So there's going to, in the future, there's going to be a political, political, religious figurehead who has God's people in bondage. He is going to refuse to let them worship God according to what the Bible says. And he's specifically going to create anti-Sabbath legislation. So let's, let's go over this again real quick. We, for the first example we had was uh, in with Abraham and Pharaoh and Sarai. That was a political religious figurehead, Pharaoh, who captured God's people, Sarah, the woman, the church, and tried to put her into an inappropriate, adulterous relationship. 
And this violates God's law. And as a result, um, plagues fell. This prevented the church. This is very important. The relationship that Pharaoh and Sarah were having prevented her from being with her husband. That's, that typologically is crazy. Over and over again, the religious political figurehead prevents God's people from being with her husband. And as a result, the plagues fell. Example two, we saw the Philistines. These were the enemies of God. They were trying to usurp the authority and law of God. They were subjecting the authority and law of God to their own power. And as a result, plagues fell. Example number three, we saw Pharaoh, a political religious figurehead. He had God's people in bondage. Pharaoh refused to let God's people worship according to the way that God had specified. This religious, this relig, this religious political uh, leader specifically created anti-Sabbath legislation, preventing God's people from keeping the Sabbath. And when this, when that took place, the plagues fell. These are absolutely, absolutely the things that we need to be looking at to see what and how the plagues are going to fall in our time. And so what's going to happen in the future? What is going to happen in the future? A political, uh, a political religious figurehead who is the enemy of God is going to bring God's people into bondage and into an inappropriate relationship. This will be spiritual adultery. This political religious figurehead is going to put God's people into a position where they cannot legally worship God according to the scripture. And according to typology, anti-Sabbath legislation is what triggers the plagues to fall. This is typology now. This is typology. This is very important. So a religious political leader is going, this religious, this religious political leader is God's enemy. This is the Antichrist, right? This religious political leader who has God's people in bondage and refuses to let them worship God according to how the scripture dictates is going to prevent God's people from being obedient to God's word through worldwide legislation. And there will be anti-Sabbath legislation specifically. That's what typology says. When this takes place, when this religious political leader who has God's people in bondage and refuses to let them worship God according to the scripture, because of legislation created, which will include anti-Sabbath legislation, the plagues are going to fall. This is, what, this is what typology says is going to happen. And if we um, ask ourselves a question, right? Do we have a political, religious, worldwide leader today who is not just a, a, a political leader, but represents a deity, right? Do we have a political, worldwide, religious leader? Yes, we have that. That is the papacy. That is the Pope. Does this religious, political figure position himself as God's enemy? Yes, the papacy is God's enemy. Why? Because... The Pope claims to be God, and the Pope claims to be above Scripture. This puts the papacy as God's enemy. When you say that you are above God and you are above Scripture, you're placing yourself in authority above the authority of God, and you're placing yourself in authority above the law of God. So yes, the papacy does position himself to be God's enemy. Let's ask ourselves another question. Does this political religious leader, the papacy, 
have God's people in bondage? Absolutely. If you know anything about the papacy, if you know about the history of the Protestant Reformation and how the papacy had kept people in bondage mentally, spiritually, and physically through all the apostate doctrines that she has, yes, the papacy has God's people in bondage. We've done several Bible studies on that. If you're sticking with us up to this point and you've been around a couple times, you know that. Now, let's ask ourselves this. This is where it gets deep. Does this political, religious figurehead, the papacy, who has God's people in bondage, does this person have legislation in the works right now that is going to put the people of the world and the remnant church of God into a position that if they honor God and the seventh day Sabbath, they will break world law? Yes, there is legislation that is to be signed October 15th, 2020. The Pope has a document that is to be enforced worldwide called Leo Dato C. This is a document that is in the guise, that's in the disguise of climate change. And this legislation is for the whole world. And this, inside this legislation, is a portion which is known as the Green Sabbath Act. This Green Sabbath Act is going to say that the whole world must rest from their burdens on the first day of the week, not the seventh day of the week. So, this legislation from a religious, political world leader who has God's people in bondage is specifically making legislation this year. It's going to be signed by the whole world that says you're not to be obedient to God. You're not going to be obedient to God and rest on the seventh day. You're going to rest on the first day. This is very, very important. We need to be very careful. We need to stay close to God. We need to be at his hip. This is why the book of Revelation says over and over and over, over and over and over. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience and faith of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We need to have this mentality of keeping the commandments of God through the power and strength of the Holy Spirit. We ain't, we ain't doing this by ourselves. And we need to have the faith of Jesus that I am able to overcome no matter what happens, no matter what God allows to come my way, he's going to give me the strength to overcome it keeping the Ten Commandments and having the faith of Jesus. This is going to prevent us from ever worshiping the image of the beast, from receiving the mark of the beast. This will prevent us from having the plagues to fall on us. If we do this, if we keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, it will be impossible for the end time to deception to fall upon us. Now, these last seven plagues, right? We saw how the plagues are going to fall. There's a political leader who's a religious figurehead who has God's people in bondage. This religious political leader is God's enemy and he's preventing God's people from worshiping God according to the way that he dictates. And when he makes legislation preventing God's people from following the scriptures, plagues fall. We are in a position right now, we're in a position right now where we have a worldwide leader who's a religious figurehead, who has God's people in bondage, who is at the verge, October 15, 2020, he's at the verge of having legislation signed by the whole world that prevents God's people from worshiping the way that the Bible says to. What is the inevitable result? What is the inevitable result? The inevitable result is plagues are going to fall. That's just the inevitable result. Specifically, 
there's going to be anti-Sabbath anti legislation. When you see the anti-Sabbath legislation, when that's when you know the plagues are going to fall. When they specifically say you cannot keep the Sabbath, that's when the plagues are going to fall. Okay, so let's look at these seven last plagues, right? Because God has a message in these seven last plagues. And we want to understand what is about to take place, right? We want to understand what's about to take place. The world is being channeled down a specific mind frame, a one world mind frame. And as the world is being channeled into a one world mind frame, they are beginning to say that the Christians are the problem. And we got to be very careful as Christians. And I, I'm, I'm saying this, like, I mean this, like, very much. As Christians, we represent Christ. Everything that we say and do should be glorifying God, should be bringing respect and honor to the Creator. As we dialogue with people, as we converse with people, are we being rude? Are we being ignorant? As I say what I'm about to say, I want to be very careful, right, because... There's a world of conspiracy theories. And I could sit here and I could tell you all day about the Freemasons and the Jesuits. And I could tell you all kinds of stuff. Why don't I do that? Because that stuff is less important as getting our hearts and minds right with Christ. Are those things real? Yes, they're real. But that's less important important than getting our hearts and minds with Christ. And as we're having dialogue, as we're arguing with people on the other side of the fence, are we trying to win them over to Christ with our love and our compassion? Or are we trying to convince them that they're wrong and that we're right? Because I'll tell you what, no one has ever come to Christianity because they were guilted into feeling wrong. That, 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 that's not how it works. They fall in love with Jesus. We have to be very careful because as we say all kinds of things about conspiracy theories and all kinds of stuff like that, we're going to be labeled as nuts. And what's going to happen? As the Christians are refusing to accept the vaccine, I'm not taking the vaccine. I'm not going to take it. But what's going to happen? They're going to throw me in the category of being a loony a conspiracy theorist, and they're going to put me in a FEMA camp. It's just what's going to happen. We have to hold back that as long as we can. And the only way to do that is to be kind and loving and not come off as loonies because a lot of times we're more focused on conspiracy theories than we are the gospel. And that's very dangerous. And that's going to put us in a FEMA camp way sooner than we need to be. And I just wanted to give that, share that with you, because we're getting into these useless arguments for no reason, trying to prove we're right when we're not right. We're like Abraham. We are the liars. We're, we, we should have plagues fall on us. But because God loves us and we've repented, he prevents that from happening. These plagues, these le seven last plagues that take place, there's a message in them. There's a message in them. And this is the message. The message is that God's wrath is going to be poured out into this world. And that when the seven last plagues take place, it's going to be a time that no one has ever witnessed. The closest thing that we can compare it to is when the plagues fell on Egypt and on Pharaoh. The seven last plagues answers everything that happened before the plagues. Now, that's a funny statement. But the seven last plagues answer everything that happened before the plagues fall. What is it that the wicked are going to do to God's people? Well, God addresses that in the seven last plagues. And as God addresses that in the seven last plagues, what he does is he doubles the portion that was given to us. I'm going to show you what I mean in a minute. Revelation 18, 6. 
Revelation 18, 6. I appreciate you. I, I appreciate you staying with me. I appreciate you staying with me. Revel now, this is the backdrop. The plagues are falling on the wicked. The, wick the, the plagues are falling on the wicked. The plagues always fall on the unrepentant. The plagues do not fall upon the repentant. Was God's people going through the plagues in the time of Egypt? Was God's people going through the plagues at the time of Egypt? They were. Did Sarah and Abraham go through the plagues in the time of Egypt? They did. But did the plagues affect them? No. There's a difference between God's people and the people that the plagues fall on. Will the 144,000 go through the plagues? They will. But what if you're not part of the 144,000? This is what happens to people that are not part of the 144,000. And as a result of them slaughtering the Christians, plagues fall. This is what God says in Revelation 18, 6. Let's go back a, let's, let's go back a little bit. Revelation chapter 18, verse 3 to 6. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. Now check this out. Reward her even as she rewarded you double unto her, double according to her works in the cup, which she filled, filled to her double. Check this out. Prior to the plagues, the wicked wanted to cause God's people to suffer. We see that beginning to take place now. We see that God, the wicked are beginning to want to God's people to suffer. And so the plagues are going to fall. But as the plagues fall, it's going to fall in a double portion. Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worship his image. Very important to understand that as the mark of the beast goes forth and the decision is made throughout the world, are you going to receive the mark of the beast or are you going to stand for Christ and keep his commandments and have the faith of Jesus? This is going to divide the world down the middle. And once the decision has been made throughout the whole world where you stand and once the final person has made the final decision. This is known as the close of probation. Every living person has made their decision where they stand. They receive the mark of the beast or they receive the seal of God in their forehead. And as this takes place, Christ prepares himself. He stands up. And as he stands up in the heavenly sanctuary, getting ready to come back to receive his bride, the plagues begin to fall. And who do they fall on? They fall on the people that receive the mark of the beast. Prior to the plagues falling, the wicked wanted God's people to suffer. So God gives the first plague to all the people that have the mark of the beast. And as those people wanted God's people to suffer, now God gives them the suffering but he gives them a double portion. The second and third plague, they wanted us to stop eating and drinking. They wanted um, us to stop buying and selling. So God gives it back to them. Revelation chapter 16, verses three and uh, four. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water. What does the water stand for? What does the sea stand for? Revelation 17, 5. And the great whore where thou sawest 
set upon the waters, the waters represent peoples, nations, multitudes, and languages. So as the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, it's upon the people of the earth. And it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard an angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged. For they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So they wanted us to stop buying and selling. They wanted us to stop eating and drinking. And so God gives them blood to drink. But now this is in a double portion. So the wicked, they're going to try to stop us from buying and selling. That's what's going to happen. They're going to try us and they're going to try to get us to not eat and drink. And God's going to give it back to them double. The fourth plague. Revelation 16, 8 and 9. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. This is vastly important. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men scorched them with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over the plagues, and they repented not. Very important. Very, very important. God answers everything that the wicked wanted and doubles it, right? And so check this out. Babylon was an ancient religion that worshipped the sun, right? And here it says in the fourth plague, and God gives them the sun. He says, you want to worship the sun? I'll give it to you and I'll make it seven times hotter. Isaiah 30, 27. Isaiah 30, 27. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 27. It says, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. The indignation and his tongue devouring. Moreover, the light of the moon, the light of the sun, as the light of the sun, and the moon of the and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of the days in the day that the Lord binds up the breach of his people and heals the stroke of their wound. So as God is repaying the wicked for what they did unto his people, right? God says, you want to worship the sun? I'll give you the sun and I'll give it to you seven times than normal. Seven is the number of God. Seven is the perfect number. And this represents God. And so they want to worship the sun as a God. So God makes the sun their God and it scorches men and it burns them. It burns them with an unbelievable hot. And many people will die because of this. The fifth plague, Revelation 16, verses 10 and 11. Revelation 16, verses 10 and 11. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues and blasphemed the God of heaven because their pains and their sores, and repented not. Throughout time and time again, as these plagues fall, they are not repenting. So, of course, the plagues are going to continue to fall. And it says that this plague, the fifth plague, is darkness is darkness. Let's check this out. John 3, 19. Why did God give them darkness? John 3, 19. Here we go. John chapter 3, verse 19 says this. And this is the condemnation. This is the destruction. That light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So, Men of the world wanted darkness, right? God gives it to them. The kingdom of Satan, which represents this end time kingdom, 
is turned into darkness. The wicked want darkness, so God gives it to them. These first five plagues are a scorn to the people of the world, right? This is a uh, the world's worst time ever in history, and this is the worst chastisement to take place ever to humanity. This falls upon the people who receive the mark of the beast. As a result of these first five plagues, as a result of the first five plagues, the sixth plague takes place. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. This verse gets tossed around very badly. Let's understand what the Euphrates was. The Euphrates was the river, was the water that fed Babylon. Very important to understand. The Euphrates is the river that fed Babylon. If water represents peoples, multitudes, languages, and tongues, and Babylon represents apostate Christianity, then it says, according to Revelation 16, 12, that the waters that fed Babylon dry up. The people that feed into apostate Christianity, they realize that they've been deceived and they no longer follow the papacy or the dragon which gave him his power. They've woken up and said, the plagues have fallen on us. We are no longer associating with you. But by this time, it's too late. By this time, it's too late. What God does in the first five plagues causes the people to no longer support Babylon, no longer support the papacy. And ultimately, it becomes completely dried up. Revelation 18 um, talks about the, the desolation that takes place in the plagues. And as the plagues completely destroyed this world, the same way that when the plagues fell in ancient Egypt, it completely destroyed ancient Egypt. And in that, it showed the weakness of the Pharaoh and how he was actually nothing. And so the same thing is going to happen at the end time. The plagues are going to destroy the world. This is going to be a total collapse of everything. And that's what Revelation 18 does. Revelation 18 goes through the total collapse of everything. And so Revelation 16, the plagues fall. Revelation 18 talks about the complete description of the destruction. And if you read it, it's um, it's a complete economic collapse of every facet of any economy. And it's actually um, something that's pretty scary. And so what happens? The wicked of the earth are caused to lose everything, right? Because they cause God's people to lose everything, right? They put us in FEMA camps. They chased us to the woods. They prevented us from buying and selling anything. So God, through the plagues, pre causes the world and the wicked in the world to lose everything. But he gives it to them in a double portion. If they don't want us to buy and sell. They're preparing that right now. You can see it. You can see it right now. You can't go into the store unless you got the mark. I'm, you can't go into the store unless you got the mask. I'm sorry. But they don't want us to be buying and selling. They're preparing the world to receive this mind frame. And we got to warn the world. It's our job as Christians to warn the world. It's not our job as Christians to be telling people you're a Democrat and you're wrong. I'm a Republican and I'm, I'm, I'm right. That's not our job. The job is to preach the everlasting gospel in the context of the three angels message with love and tears in our eyes. And Revelation 18 is the complete description of the destruction that takes place from the seven last plagues. Of course, the seventh plague is when Christ comes back. There's a lot of destruction associated with it, but ultimately the seventh plague is when Christ comes back. And this is what happens in the seven last plagues. We saw the examples. We saw what the examples were on how the plagues fall. There's a religious, political leader. 
causes God's people to go into bondage prevents them from worshiping God according to God's word, specifically creates anti-Sabbath, anti-Seventh-day rest legislation. As a result, plagues fall. The plagues fall on the unrepentant. The plagues fall on those people who wanted to do away with God's people. Right, The wicked want to do away with God's people, and they destroy God's people, except for 144,000. Could, could be literal, could be symbolic. I think it's literal. If you, We'll talk about that another time. But ultimately, the wicked destroy God's people, preventing them from worshiping God according to the Bible. And when anti-Sabbath legislation is created, plagues fall. The plagues fall because God's people were destroyed. And God gives them a double portion. Maybe you don't want to be in that portion of people that the plagues fall on, right? How do I escape? How do I have my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sisters, my nieces, my nephews, my enemies? I got to want my enemies to escape that too. How do we escape these plagues, right? Why did we start with the plagues? Why didn't we go for the mark of the beast? Well, you have to understand what the plagues are. What is the image? That's what the mark of the beast is. If you go straight for the mark of the beast, you're going to get confused. You're going to think it's a vaccine. It's a chip. You're going to think it's uh, a tattoo. The Bible is going to tell us what the mark of the beast is. Same way the Bible told us the events surrounding the plagues. We're going to see next time what the events surrounding the image, and then we'll see the events surrounding the mark. And once it's all said and done, it's going to be freaky. Changed my life, and I hope it changes your life, because if it doesn't, if you ain't getting ready to reject the mark of the beast, if you ain't getting ready for the second coming, these plagues are going to fall on you. And But how do we have that not happen? How do I escape the wrath of God? How do I escape the seven last plagues? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly in Revelation 18, 2 through 5, it says this. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Babylon was that wicked church. Babylon was typified in the ecclesiastical church state of the Roman church empire which has fallen from biblical truth. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, Babylon has fallen, it's fallen, and has become a habitation of devils. Did you know that Babylon represents apostate Christianity and that the spirits actuating this apostate system is the spirit of devils? and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. For all nations have participated in the apostate teachings that Babylon has given her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. This is it. This is how the plagues don't fall on you. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. God sees his people in this system, which is destroying them. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. How do we not receive of her plagues? By not participating in her sins and coming out and being separate from her apostate worship system. That's how we do it. And it says, for her sins have reached unto heaven. And God hath remembered her iniquity. Over and over again, over and over again, we see in this Bible that it's a religious political leader that has God's people in bondage and refuses to let them worship God according to the Bible. And it's when he creates legislation that prevents God's people from worshiping in spirit and in truth that the plagues fall. There is a religious political leader right now who has God's people in bondage. That's the Pope 
That's the papacy. He has God's people in bondage by feeding them false doctrine. They're deceived. They're confused. And what God is saying is to come out of these apostate systems. If you aren't worshiping God in spirit and in truth, if the three angels' message of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, isn't the thing that's guiding your Bible study and your worship. We've been through this. If you've been here with me up to this point, you know what I'm talking about. This is not something that is on the back burner. This needs to be on the front burner. We need to be focusing on the three angels' message and sharing this truth because pretty soon, before you know it, as time flies, we're going to be stuck in a position where we don't have the ability to communicate these truths. People are going to be lost because we did not communicate these truths with them. We have family, we have friends, we have enemies that need to know this. And it's time to stop playing Republican and Democrat. It's time to stop playing left and right. It's time to start representing Christ and letting our life sermon, right? Letting our life sermon reflect the love and character of Jesus so that people will be drawn to us the same way that they were drawn to Jesus. Convincing people that a being a Republican is smarter than a Democrat, that is not salvation. Convincing people to be a conservative or a liberal is not salvation. And we need to really set those things aside, get our hearts and minds right with Christ. And then if possible, we can help people get right with Christ too. May that be our prayer. May that be our focus. And if we don't want these plagues to come out upon us, we need to come out of Babylon. We need to stop participating in her sins. And if we do that, these plagues, they will not fall upon us. So this is the study of the plagues. Not an easy message, but a necessary one. We need to know what happens. How are these plagues going down? What's happening? How do I not be part of this? Right? God loves you. I love you. And Jesus is calling us right now to a relationship with him. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, why not? We're all going to face God on the day of judgment. All of us have sinned and come uh, short of the glory of God, right? Jesus died for us. He died so that we don't have to be punished for our sins. Why do two people have to be punished for our sins? Let Thank God Jesus did that, right? Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Let's accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, now is the time for us to focus on worshiping in spirit and in truth. If you don't know how to do that, message me. We'll talk about that. The three angels message of Revelation 14 is specifically designed to get us into a place where we are worshiping in spirit and in truth. And it prepares us not to receive the mark of the beast. I want to thank you for coming to Bible study today. I'm going to go eat dinner with my wife. And as we close in prayer, let us remember that the t every day that passes, time is shorter. Christ is closer. That's a good thing. But many people are dying and, and, and being lost. That's a bad thing. Let's do what we have to do. Let's ask Jesus to have mercy on us. And if we're still found to be usable, let's ask him to use us. My love, will you come pray? Everybody knows my beautiful wife. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for just the blessing that you are to us. Love, compassionate, grace, mercy, long-suffering to us. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from any unrighteousness, and help us to honor you. Sometimes it's hard. Lord, we're balloon people. We work on the Sabbath. But we're asking you to change our hearts and desires. Help us not to worry about money. Help us to fear the one who can destroy the body and the soul in the lake of fire. That's you. Help us to honor you. Help us to prepare our hearts and minds for the second coming. And fortify us and strengthen us not to receive the mark of the beast. And help us to be kinder. Help us to reflect the love of Jesus in our heart. And help us to do your will. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. I love you, everybody. I love you.